This video was brought to you by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, a website, or an online store, make your next move with Squarespace. <laughs> It's finally ready! You, you know, I went through quite a few supers to get it worthy to fight you. Sure, it was difficult, but you are worth it. Heroes are only as good as their villains. This is a rather cliched phrase you've no doubt heard before, but there is an element of truth there. If the villain in a story is weak, then it wouldn't be that impressive when we see the hero inevitably take them down. A challenging villain often marks the final obstacle that the hero must overcome. And if that ultimate challenge is easily beatable, then the triumph is rendered effectively meaningless. If anyone can defeat the villain, then why does it matter that this guy did it? W what did you gain from this victory? Thor? Just nothing? Alright. It's cool. But a lot of the time, the villains are their own downfall. They could be holding all of the cards, ready to savor their victory against the meddling hero only to touch something they're not supposed to, or uh, get distracted, or just purposefully stop and explain their malicious plot, which might unveil a clue or flaw that the hero can exploit? He brought the monster. So, Banner, that's your play. What? Why do villains do this? Why with the monologues? It's become such a trope for evildoers to refrain from killing the hero in favor of detailing their sinister plans that it's been lampooned in the genre that arguably popularized it. Superhero stories. For example, Age of Ultron had a line poking fun at the idea. What's the vibranium for? I'm glad you asked that because I wanted to take this time to explain my evil plan. Years before that, readers saw a similar critique in the superhero deconstructing graphic novel Watchmen and its movie adaptation. I'm not a comic book villain. Do you seriously think I'd explain my masterstroke to you if there were even the slightest possibility you could affect the outcome? But there is perhaps no greater mocking of this staple of supervillainy than in Pixar's The Incredibles. If you've never seen the film, first of all, do that. Just go go watch it today, if possible. It's really it's really good. But okay, just to get you through this video, think of The Incredibles as uh, the Fantastic Four meets Watchmen. Like the FF, The Incredibles features a super family of 1960s America comprised of a strong guy, a stretchy person, an invisible girl, and uh, the dash likes. Just a second. Well, they're both blonde, I guess. Oh, and there's Jack Jack. He's great. <laughs> The story is about superheroes coming out of retirement to fight a new threat in a world that doesn't want anything to do with heroes. Underneath the film's sleek comic book iconography, the Pars are just a dysfunctional family of supers who always seem to be on the brink of crumbling under the pressure to be normal. It's perfectly normal. Normal? To you. What do you know about normal? What does anyone in this family know about normal? Now, wait a minute, young we lady. Act normal, Mom. I want to be normal. Their worldviews, and their very lives for that matter, are tested by the villainous Syndrome. <laughs> Syndrome's dramatic entrance halfway through the film sparks a classic setup. The villain has captured the hero. His nemesis is cornered. So naturally, he just can't resist delivering a grand speech. As he drones on, Syndrome becomes distracted in his own delivery, giving Mr. Incredible an opportunity to recuperate and retaliate. <laughs> You sly dog! You got me monologuing! I can't believe it! The message here is clear. Villainous monologues are stupid and counterproductive. <clears throat> but here's the thing. This scene actually demonstrates the exact opposite. In fact, this exchange shows precisely why supervillain monologues are genuinely brilliant narrative devices. Let's break down this one-sided conversation to see why this seemingly indefensible trope in superhero storytelling is actually genius. Yeah, that's right, I'm about to monologue at you about why I think monologues are great. Shut up, we're doing this! What are you waiting for? I don't know, something amazing, I guess. Oh, we'll get to some amazing analysis, son, but in the spirit of self-aggrandizing antagonists, verbose villains, and speechifying scoundrels, here's an appropriately lengthy history of supervillain monologues in fiction. Follow me, you wonderful nerds, to... to... to learn town. <laughs> 
The monologue as a narrative device has been around pretty much since the birth of theater itself, referring to a long-winded speech delivered by one character, usually to another, but for some reason, villains seem especially prone to monologue in superhero stories. It's the unspoken truth of humanity that you crave subjugation. The bright lure of freedom diminishes your life's joy in a mad scramble for power. There are eight million people in this city, and those teeming masses exist for the sole purpose of lifting the few exceptional people onto their shoulders. To them, you're just a freak, like me. They need you right now. But when they don't, they'll cast you out, like a leper. The examples are figuratively endless, and it's clear that The Incredibles means to critique this evil speech trope associated with comic book villains, but how did this trope get started at all? Well, if I wanted to be unnecessarily detailed, as I hold you hostage from being able to click away from this video, stop it! I would start with this guy. This is the ancient Greek poet Simonides. Before him, ancient poets didn't directly charge money for their individual works. They relied on a system of patronage afforded by rulers and wealthy benefactors, a system that's still kind of around today. Support me on Patreon! But all that started to change with Simonides, who said, screw that, I want money. Simonides insisted that if someone commissions a poem, they need to pay the poet directly for their work. Flash forward a couple thousand years and you can see the result of that shifting mindset in something like pulp magazines. These publications became synonymous with cheap, often unremarkable exploitation fiction. Tales that weren't trying to be the next great American novel, but were instead just an afternoon of frankly lurid entertainment. They were deliberately designed to be a cheap, down-market product, being printed on low-cost, untrimmed wood pulp paper, hence the name, but another way the publishers cut costs was to pay the writers a low wage, based not on the quality of their words, but the quantity. This system may have been a catalyst for villainous monologues in the tales of Doc Savage or The Shadow. As author Peter Coogan writes in Superhero, The Secret Origin of a Genre, quote, writers working for a few cents a word had a great incentive to fill pages with villain speechifying, end quote. You can observe a similar trend in old serials where an evil doctor might drone on and on about their master plan just so the story would be able to fill a dozen episodes. As pulp magazines were effectively the predecessors of the modern comic book, you would think that this practice of self-aggrandizing evildoers would carry over from the pulps to the superhero comics, but they actually didn't. At least, not immediately. Early superhero comics didn't have too many monologuing villains, not because they didn't want to, but because they were structured differently during the birth of the industry. You can pick up an average comic today and expect one story from cover to cover, usually around 20 pages or so, but uh, really, you typically only get one piece of the story that spans over multiple issues. Comics back in the early days, however, were paced quite differently. If we look all the way back at Action Comics number one, which launched the superhero comic book boom with the debut of... Ah, uh, forgot this guy's name. It's Mr. Mr. Action? It'll come to me. Uh, the comic book itself was over 60 pages long, but it wasn't all dedicated to the man in the red trunks. His story was only one of nine stuffed into this comic book. So even though the actual magazine was lengthier than the average comic that you would buy today, each individual story inside was shorter. They could range anywhere between four pages, like Sticky Mitt Stimson or The Adventures of Marco Polo, all the way up to 10 to 12 pages, like Tex Thompson, Zaytara, or uh, Blue Red S Guy? And most of these stories, regardless of how few pages they were allotted, had to tell a complete tale from start to finish. Readers weren't expected to pick up each following issue to find out what happened to Superman. Superman! That's what his name... Sorry, I just needed a way to end that bit. The point is that most comic stories were short and had to wrap up the narrative in one go. There just weren't enough pages to spare for extravagant speeches by the story's antagonists, so supervillain monologues weren't much of a thing. And since we're on the subject of Superman right now, let's take a look at Lex Luthor, one of the most iconic comic book villains in existence. He is nothing if not arrogantly verbose, a poster child for villainous monologues in just about every appearance across comics, cartoons, and movies. And yet, his first appearance in Action Comics number 23 gave him all of two 
panels at the end of the issue to explain his evil plan. That is hardly a monologue by today's standards, but the writers and artists just didn't have the real estate to both tell a complete story from start to finish and have a character deliver a long-winded speech. That all changed as comic books left the golden age and moved into the Silver Age. Uh, by the way, if you're confused at all about the different ages of comics, I made a video about them a couple years ago that might be worth a look. All you really need to know for this video is that the Silver Age led to comic books adopting the format that we're used to today, typically moving away from lengthy anthologies towards comics that have fewer pages overall, but with nearly all of those pages dedicated to one piece of a larger ongoing story. This format afforded writers the ability to stuff each issue with as few or as many words as they wanted. And if your name was Stan Lee, you exploited this format to show off your excessive use of language. Villains like Doctor Doom, Red Skull, Mysterio, and many, many more all exercised their true powers of unrestrained, lavish language. In addition to its function as a way for Stan to make a pretentious display of his vocabulary and feel like he's contributing while artists like Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko do all the real work, it served a practical purpose in the story as well. Because one superhero adventure could be split up across multiple issues of a comic series, a supervillain monologue could serve as a useful tool to recap the plot, emphasize essential details that the readers may have missed, uh, or just generally catch the audience up before the climax. And here lies the evil monologue's most practical narrative use, filling in any crucial gaps in knowledge. If we look at The Incredibles, which you'll recall is what this video is supposed to be about, we see that immediately upon capturing Mr. Incredible, Syndrome wastes no time revealing his secret identity and recapping the series of events that led him to becoming a genius billionaire supervillain. That's the way it works. Turns out there are a lot of people, whole countries who want respect, and they will pay through the nose to get it. How do you think I got rich? I invented weapons, and now I have a weapon that only I could defeat. Remember, The Incredibles opens in the late 1940s to establish a world filled with superheroes. But after lawsuits and government initiatives begin to crack down on supers, the setting jumps ahead 15 years to 1962. A lot has happened in that time period that we as the audience have missed. Syndrome's grand speech towards Mr. Incredible sheds light on a chunk of the world that the story skipped out on. As a kid, Buddy Pine was Mr. Incredible's biggest fan. He desperately wanted to become the sidekick to his favorite hero. He wanted to fight crime as Incrediboy, but Mr. Incredible pushed him away. He rejected Buddy. This event sparked Buddy's transformation into Syndrome. Equally as important, it paints the villain in a more sympathetic light. The reason Syndrome recaps his backstory isn't just because he wants to make sure everyone's on the same page. He wants to gain sympathy from Mr. Incredible. And maybe some from us while he's at it. Sure, not all of us can relate to wealthy evil geniuses like Syndrome or Luther or Kingpin even, but a well-crafted monologue can be an excellent tool for making unapproachable masterminds seem more human. In Syndrome's case, we see that he didn't become a megalomaniac just for the sake of it. Buddy is the way that he is because he felt betrayed by the person he looked up to the most. All I wanted was to help you. I only wanted to help! And what did you say to me? Fly home, buddy. I work alone. It tore me apart. But I learned an important lesson. You can't count on anyone, especially your heroes. Even though Buddy was rejected by his hero 15 years ago, it's clear that he still respects Mr. Incredible. He doesn't just kill off his rival quickly. To Syndrome, defeating Mr. Incredible is personal. It's a victory to savor. You know how a lot of critiques of evil monologues are like, why don't the villains just kill the hero instead of talking? I mean, one more jolt of this death ray, and I'm an epitaph theory. Somehow, I managed to find cover in what does Baron Von Ruthless do? <laughs> he starts monologuing. He starts <laughs> monologuing. He starts like this prepared speech yeah. about how feeble I am compared to him, <laughs> how inevitable my defeat is. Uh, how the world will soon be his. <laughs> yada, yada, yada. Yeah, right. Yammering. I mean, a guy has me on a platter and he won't shut up. <laughs> yeah, but th this is why. Uh, yes, villains could just quickly kill the heroes in these circumstances, but aside from the fact that not all villains are murderous, hashtag not all villains, the ones who are respect the hero too much to just swiftly kill them in silence and move on. 
Syndrome wants Mr. Incredible to understand him. He opens up about his past and his master plan because he believes his former hero is worthy enough to hear it. We don't know if Syndrome delivered similar speeches before he killed off the other heroes like Gazer Beam or Blaze Stone or Down Burst, but I'd wager that he didn't because they weren't nearly as important or formative to his life as Mr. Incredible was. Monologuing is about respect. I was wrong to treat you that way. I'm sorry. See? Now you respect me, because I'm a threat. It's made evident that Buddy never stopped holding Mr. Incredible in such high regard. He tries to project an air of confidence as he gloats about how rich and smart he is, but you can catch his insecurities slipping with two little lines at the end of his monologue. Am I good enough now? Who's super now? This exchange also highlights the need for a villain to feel superior to their nemesis. The evildoer already believes that they are smarter and more powerful than the hero, and that hubris is validated the moment they've backed their rival into a seemingly inescapable corner. I mean, what villain could resist the tantalizing opportunity to gloat, to bask in their evident superiority, to finally say, I knew it, I'm better than you. And I just proved it. You mean you killed off real heroes so that you could pretend to be one? Oh, I'm real. Real enough to defeat you! And I did it without your precious gifts, your oh-so-special powers. And I'm gonna pause right here because this scene, Syndrome's second monologue, explores the final function of villainous verbosity, theatrics. As we discussed at the beginning of this video, monologues find their home in the theater, so it only makes sense that Syndrome emphasizes how vital theatricality is to his master plan. Oh, come on! You gotta admit this is cool! Just like a movie! The robot will emerge dramatically, do some damage, thrones of screaming people, and just when all hope is lost, Syndrome will save the day! I'll be a bigger hero than you ever were. I'll give them heroics. I'll give them the most spectacular heroics anyone's ever seen! Many villains, especially those in superhero stories, tend to add artistic theatrical elements to their crimes. Joker disguising hostages as henchmen and vice versa while conducting an explosive social experiment on the citizens of Gotham. A Green Goblin setting up a game which aimed to force Spider-Man to decide between saving a bunch of random kids or whoever this lady is, I think it's his sister, or Lex Luthor who always has great plans and definitely isn't a buffoon in every movie adaptation. He's really smart, guys. I promise. Coogan describes these villains as, quote, impresarios, putting on a show of sorts, and the heroes who oppose them are their audience, end quote. And a captive audience at that. The Incredibles captures this idea in one of my favorite moments of the film. You can see Syndrome snap into an overly dramatic delivery and then break character for a moment after he realizes he's lost his audience. I'm Syndrome, your nemesis in it! Oh, brilliant. It shows that Syndrome is, on some level at least, aware that he's putting on a performance, conscious of the theatrics inherent in being a supervillain, and definitely aware of the specific trope of monologuing. You sly dog! You got me monologuing! I can't believe it! <laughs> I know that to some of you there's nothing that I could say that would make villainous monologues seem less silly or illogical, but I think that's kind of the point. In old school superhero comics, the heroes were characters with firm, rational beliefs about good and evil. There were no morally complex gray areas. A criminal breaks the law, the hero stops them, right? In this way, Superheroes in these early stories were often a place where the audience was meant to find a sense of stability. You know, the, the world is a mess. But through the hero, we can declutter the chaos and gain a feeling of pure, rational understanding. That's part of what makes them super. Your average person is rarely as reasonable, and villains, naturally, are less so. They're often written to express some kind of mania, which could honestly be an entire video itself, but it, more to the point is something that I've mentioned before in my video about the philosophy of Thanos, but I do think that it's worth repeating here. Just because a character's mindset is inconsistent or irrational doesn't inherently make them poorly written. If adequately explored, these illogical facets can make characters well-rounded and more believable. So yeah. 
villains stopping in their tracks to monologue at heroes instead of just killing them outright might seem irrational, but the next time that you see it pop up in a film or a TV show, take a second to analyze what the speech is accomplishing in the narrative. Because the truth is that this trope allows us to see hidden depths of the villain's personality, to empathize with their struggles and motivations, and to understand the genuine respect they have for the hero as a worthy foe. And I guess I will continue to unironically defend supervillain monologues because I don't think they're silly. I think they're actually kind of incredible. <laughs> How's that for some forced wordplay? Now, I will permit you to speak. What do you think about supervillain monologues? Do you think they're useful and interesting like I do? Or are you wrong? Let me know your thoughts in the comments or on Twitter at NerdSync, especially if you have a favorite evil monologue. I'd love to know what it is. And of course, I wanna give a huge thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Squarespace is the best way to build a website. I've used it for a bunch of my different projects, like the book that I'm writing over at realoriginsbook.com, or my personal website that has a lot of my face on it. They've got these beautiful templates that are also highly customizable, so you can personalize it and make it stand out. And in fact, just this year, they added eight new templates to really get your creative juices flowing for whatever project that you're working on. And just because Squarespace loves you wonderful nerds, they're gonna help you get started right away, even easier, even faster. Just head on over to squarespace.com to start your free trial. You can start playing around and experimenting, building your site, and when you're ready to check out, go to squarespace.com slash nerdsync and save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. So if you're ready to launch your new business, go out there and make it and get started with Squarespace. And as always, I wanna give my genuine thanks to our patrons who support these videos that we make. Uh, this is all of their names, they're all great, but I especially wanna thank Christopher Lang, Everett Parrott, and Sonali Monka. If you wanna support our videos and get your name here on this ever-growing wall of beautiful people, head on over to patreon.com slash nerdsync. Link in the description. Click or tap right here for another one of our videos that YouTube's mysterious algorithm thinks you personally will enjoy. Let's test it out. And if you're feeling exceptionally wild, you madman, hit that big sexy subscribe button. Thanks for watching, my name is Scott, reminding you to read between the panels and grow smarter through comics. See ya.